start off and call this meeting to order. And if you can all please stand and join me in the reciting of the Pledge of Allegiance. First item is a review revision of the agenda. Do any of the directors have any revisions they'd like to make for tonight? Seeing none. Okay. Then we'll move forward with the agenda as presented. Um, next, we'll have the reading of the mission and vision statement. Uh, Director Richardson, do you mind reading that tonight? I'd be happy to. Our mission statement is graduating all students to be college and career ready challenging, inspiring, and empowering them to be healthy and productive citizens. And our vision, North Wasco is a premier school district. We provide students with a rigorous and relevant education with schools performing academically in the top 5% of the nation. Our students are inspired by a talented, innovative, and highly effective staff that values continuous professional growth. Our district graduate citizens who are ethical and motivated to achieve North their Wasco limitless is potential. North Wasco is fully embraced by the community, reflecting its health and well being. Director Richardson. Next is our student and staff recognition. Um, we're going to be starting off with the recognition of our district office confidential staff. So, with Owen, we'll be presenting that. Hello. Hello. All right. We're working now. Um, so tonight we would uh, like to take a moment to recognize our wonderful, wonderful confidential staff at the district office. Um, this team is really the glue that holds the district office together. Um, and I'm going to share a few words um, from uh, some of the different district office staff members um, in our office regarding our confidential staff. So first up, we have Miss Cindy Miller. Cindy is an emblematic of hope, positivity, and going the extra mile. She's a model for putting students first, as I have per personally witnessed and listened to her assisting our families and youth with just about anything they need. She's an excellent listener, seeking to understand first before offering feedback or advice. She is extremely knowledgeable about the district and carries a history that is invaluable to all of us. I could not have asked nor hoped for a better assistant for my first year as superintendent. Cindy, you have a heart of gold, and I'm so honored to count you among my colleagues and my friends, Dr. B. And myself, I'm going to second that. Next up, we have Becky Beeks. Becky Beeks is in our human resources office as our assistant. As I transitioned into the human resources director role, Becky Beeks was welcomed me with open arms and is patient and kind as I get up to speed with the department. She's approachable, easy to learn from, and a great resource. Our office would not nearly be as efficient as if it weren't for Becky. She treats all staff with grace and kindness and support their many questions with ease. Becky is detail-oriented and I appreciate her work ethic, great attitude, and I am so grateful to have her as our human resources assistant. I look forward to learning a lot more from our best confidential assistant around, Becky Beeks. And that's from our human resources director, Sandy. Next up, we have Jessica Riez. Jessica is more often than not the first face you'll see when you enter the district office. And she's always also the first one that's there to help when anyone needs something. Jessica gets to juggle a lot in her role. Whether it's answering the door, a phone call, or an email, it seems that she's constantly faced with a wide variety of needs and questions around every corner. She handles all that is thrown at her with her grace and a willingness to help. Over the last year of working with Jessica, I don't think of a day has gone by where I haven't relied on her. Whether it's for a piece of knowledge, as my second set of eyes, a Spanish translation, or as my guinea pig to help me test things out before going live, like emails and mm, websites, Jessica, I can't thank you enough for all that you do for our district and for me. On the financial side of our district office, first up we have Olivia Murillo. Olivia works as our accounting specialist who has worked for the district since 2017. She's a vital member of our team, especially if you need to purchase, procure, or pay for many items, which, hey, we do a lot of that. 
She also wears multiple hats helping with translations when asked and a key member of the wellness committee as she obtained a $10,000 grant from MODA for wellness corners in our schools. Olivia brings along fun conversations, candor, and we appreciate her hard work and her dedication. Jillian McNeil has worked in payroll since 2019, but has worked in a variety of roles with the district since 2004, where she was a nutrition aide. Jillian is mostly appreciated on the 20th of the month when everyone is paid. She's also a vital member of the business office team. If the staff are not paid timely or correctly, nothing works. Jillian's meticulous work helps the business office flow and is appreciated for both her hard work, her fun, and her colorful spirit. Last but not least is Carrie Newland. Carrie is the newest office, office addition to the business team as our accounting specialist. She started earlier this year at a time when we thought all might be lost as no qualified applicants were anywhere to be seen. Not only did Carrie come from another state, but she also brings with a wealth of knowledge and experience. She brings a calm nature to the office with a work dedication that only someone who appreciates filing grant reports can understand. Carrie is unable to attend tonight, but we'll make sure she hears the district's appreciation. If those of my wonderful confidential staff would be able to come forward, I have a, a nice certificate for you, um, as well as a gift from our sponsor tonight, which is Columbia Gorge Real Estate. All right. Thank you, Ms. Bowen. And thank you to Cindy, Becky, Jessica, Olivia, Jillian, and Carrie. Awesome work um, that you do for our district. And then special thanks to Columbia Gorge Real Estate for sponsoring that this month. Um, next, um, in terms of recognition, we have our TDHS Spring Sports Update. Uh, and our AD, Mr. Billy Bros, will present that. Good evening, I'm Billy Brost, I'm the athletic director. Uh, last month when I provided you guys with a spring sports update, the 5A All-State softball team had yet to be announced because the season was still going. And then OSA drug their feet a little bit in announcing that team. Uh, once it came out, I wanted uh, those individuals recognized because they are the epitome of what we're trying to do not only in softball, but uh, as athletes and as students. Uh, so tonight we, we have three of our Riverhawk girls that were selected uh, for the OSA 5A All-State team. Uh, Ms. Kennedy Abbas was selected as a second team pitcher. Uh, Despina Seafalamua was second team outfielder as a freshman. And then uh, sophomore Zoe LeBreton was third team catcher. Uh, so I want to congratulate each of these young ladies on an outstanding season. I'm so very excited that all of them returned along with their teammates. We did not lose a single senior, so I'm really excited about softball next year. So thank you, ladies, and congratulations. All right, that concludes our student staff recognition for tonight. Uh, next item on the agenda is our special July board organizational designations. So um, this is something school board must conduct um, an organization meeting after July 1 to begin the new or each new fiscal year. And that's per ORS 332.040 and 255.335. So with that, um, the first item is the election of board chair for this upcoming year. Um, so directors, I'll entertain any nominees um, for that position. Director Richardson. I move to appoint Director Aparicio to chair of the board. All right, thank you, Director Richardson. 
will accept the nomination. Uh, any Second. other nominations for uh, chair? Thank you. All right. Seeing none, um, then uh, we'll move to a vote. Um, we've got a single nomination of um, myself for chair for the upcoming year. Um, I'll do a roll call vote. Um, Chair, you need a second on that. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Sorry, I'm just writing down names. Um, all right, we've got um, a nomination uh, for myself as chair. Do I have a second for that? Second. I'll second that. All right, seconded by Director Rasmussen. So we've got motion. Um, for or nomination for myself to be chair for the upcoming year, seconded by Director Asperson. Any further discussion on that? Seeing none. All right, now we will uh, move to the vote. Um, Director Lopez. Director Rasmussen. Aye. Director Jones. Aye. Director Nelson. Aye. Director Stevens. Jose, did you call me? Yes. Sorry, I, I'm driving through the gorge to the airport. That's why my video is not on. My audio will be subpar. But I, I, uh, my vote is for you, so I. Yep. Thank you, Director Stevens. Uh, Director Richardson. Aye. Um, and I will be abstaining from the vote. Um, but the motion carries. Next um, is the election of the board vice chair. Do I have any um, nominations for that position? I mean, uh, Dave Jones. Okay, do we have guys? I'll, I'll second that. Okay, and Director Jones, do you accept that nomination? Yes. Okay, so I've got a nomination from Director Nelson, second by Director Stevens. Any further discussion on that? All right, seeing none, we'll move to votes. Director Lopez. Aye. Director Rasmussen. Aye. Director Jones. Aye. Director Nelson? Aye. Director Stevens? Aye. Director Richardson? Aye. Chair votes aye as well. Okay. Um, next is the approval of the annual board organizational chart for the 2022-2023 school year. So that document um, has been updated and was included in our packet. Um, any questions uh, regarding um, the update to that? If not, I will entertain or entertain a motion for its adoption. I will make a motion to adopt the annual board organizational chart for 22-23 as presented. Second. All right, so I've got a motion by Director Rasmussen, seconded by Director Richardson to approve the annual board organizational chart for the 2022-2023 school year as presented. Any further discussion on that? Not seeing none. So with that, we'll move to the vote. Uh, Director Lopez. Director Rasmussen. Aye. Director Jones. Aye. Director Nelson. Aye. Director Stevens. Aye. Director Richardson? Aye. Chair votes aye as well. Next is the appointment of school board members to uh, the various uh, board subcommittees that we have. Um, so first we have the D21 Education Foundation, currently served in this past year by Director Jones. Director Jones, is that something you'd still like to continue or? Yeah, I never really got to the meeting because it was just the last little bit. Okay. Uh, anyone else have any interest? If not, I will just appoint Director Jones to that position for this upcoming year. Not seeing none, so we'll appoint Director Jones to the D21 Education Foundation. Next is the community outreach team currently served by Director Stevens. Is that something you'd still like to continue, Director Stevens? Yes. Okay. Any other interest in being the board person for community outreach? 
Okay. With that, um, I'll appoint uh, Director Stevens for the upcoming year to the community outreach team. Next is the wellness committee, currently served by Director Richardson. Is that something you'd like to continue for this year? Yes, I would. Okay. Any other interest in that role? If not, we'll appoint Director Richardson. Seeing none, then we'll appoint uh, Director Richardson to the wellness committee. The next subcommittee that we had was the building facilities report and given um, the nature of being um, in preparation for a bond, um, we were gonna be looking to eliminate that, assuming I've got consensus from the board and we will not appoint anyone and we'll just let kind of the bond process continue forward. Is there any objection? Okay, not seeing none. So we will be eliminating the building facilities report um, from our subcommittee section. Next is a district equity committee currently served by Director Rasmussen. Is that something you'd still like to continue for the upcoming year? Yes. Okay. Any other interest for that? Not seeing none. Um, so we will have Director Rasmussen continue um, this year on the district equity committee. Next is the Wasco County Forest Collaboratives currently served by Director Nelson. Um, is that something you'd like to continue this next year, Director Nelson? Okay, any other interest from the other directors? Okay, um, then we'll appoint Director Nelson to continue on the Wasco County Force Collaborative. Next is, and lastly, the D21 Scholarship Committee, currently served by Director Rich, or excuse me, Director Stevens. Um, is that something you still like to continue, Director Stevens? Yes. Okay, any other interest yes. from Okay, um, then we'll move Director Stevens to the D21 Scholarship Committee. All right, that concludes the appointments for subcommittees, um, which brings us to our consent agenda. There are two items. This meeting, uh, one is a school board meeting hearing minutes from the June 16, 2022 meeting, and then we also have an updated personnel report. Um, any comments? Uh, Feedback from the directors. If not, I will entertain a motion. I will make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Okay, got a motion. Do I have a second for that motion? All right, got a motion by Director Rasmussen to approve the consent agenda as presented, seconded by Director Nelson. Any further discussion on those items? Seeing none, so we'll move to a vote. Uh, Director Lopez. Director Rasmussen. Aye. Director Jones. Aye. Director Nelson. Aye. Director Stevens. Aye. Director Richardson. Aye. Chair votes aye as well. All right, next is just a review of our board uh, action calendar. We've got the months of July and August. Um, July, we've got obviously our organizational meeting happening tonight. Uh, some of you uh, were able to attend the OSB Assembly Board Conference in Bend or virtually that just passed um, a couple weeks ago. Um, as you can see, one of the changes, um, we are shifting um, our typical summer board retreat to October. Um, and so um, we'll see that move to the month of October from the normal time frame of August. Um, and then um, you can see kind of looking ahead in terms of our uh, district PLT meetings, um, we're targeting January and May as kind of our new um, uh, months that we will have those meetings. Um, so there's some slight adjustments um, for the upcoming school year. Um, and then August, obviously, as the school year gets kicked off. There's gonna be a variety of back to school events and other activities to be able to start attending um, once kiddos are back in the buildings and school's well underway. So any questions or kind of changes um, that we've got coming up? Okay, not seeing none. All right, um, let's see. Um, School Board Subcommittee Reports is next. Um, 
in the summer. I don't know, we'll, we'll go through each one, but I'm assuming probably not too many updates, but starting with scholarship committee, Director Stevens. Yes, we don't have a meeting set up. Okay, uh, what about community outreach? The meeting is moved from tomorrow into the end of the month. Yep. All right, so we'll have something next meeting. Um, next is a wellness committee. I don't have a report this evening. Okay. Uh, we've removed building facilities. Um, Director Rasmussen, any update on equity committee? We did not have a meeting in June and July due to the transition from with our new HR uh, director. All right. Um, Wasco County Forest Collaborative, Director Nelson. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, next is the OSBA Legislative Policy Committee, Director Richardson. I do not have a report from the LPC at this time. Um, when it's appropriate, I have a short report from the OSBA Summer Conference. Okay. And lastly, uh, D21 Ed Foundation, Director Jones. Nothing. All right, that concludes our board subcommittee reports. Um, next, um, this is gonna be a new agenda item uh, moving forward for this upcoming year. And this is the staff report in which we will have representatives from the D21 Education Association and also the North Wasco Education Support Professionals um, group. So, um, they were not able to attend tonight, but I will read um, their message for everyone. Uh, D21 EA and uh, NWESP would like to thank Dr. Bernal and the school board for the opportunity to speak at each board meeting. While both unions are observing the full month of July as a wellness month, we will not be present at this meeting to speak in person. We would like again to thank you for the best contract negotiations we have ever had. We have said it many times, but we'll say it again for more to hear. We look forward to continuing the fantastic partnership that was built this year between D21EA and WESP and Dr. Bernal and the school board. We realize how lucky we are to have such a caring and devoted superintendent and school board. We are all looking forward to coming back in August, rested and rejuvenated. To each board member and to Dr. Bernal, a huge thank you for your continued dedication to North Wasco County School District. Sincerely, Jody Ketchum, the D21EA president, and then Charlene Bonham and Sylvia Brock, the NWESP co-presidents. So as I mentioned, moving forward, they will be attending meetings and providing a report. That brings us to um, our new business and uh, our presentations and reports for tonight. First one that we have is a district communications update and it's regarding the Parent Square communication system. And we'll have our director of communications, uh, Ms. Bowen, tell us all about it. Me again. So I just wanted to take a moment to give you a brief overview of our new parent teacher communication tool, which is called Parent Square. Uh, you may remember that a few months ago that we decided to look at potentially changing um, our, our communication tools. Um, we were currently contracting with a company called Remind and our contract was coming to a close. Um, for myself, I felt that there was some unmet needs um, and at the time I decided to reach out to um, some additional staff, teachers, um, and get some additional feedback to see if it was something that we wanted to pursue changing. So a few months ago this spring, we sent out a survey to our staff um, and we found some interesting things. So this is just a little bit of uh, background before I launch into the actual new system. So when it came to our mind, we found that only 28% of our teachers were using the system as their primary source of communication, which was surprising to me. Um, the second statistic that I found surprising was that on a scale of one to 10, over 39% of our staff indicated that they had a less than positive user experience with the uh, communication tool remind with 19.3% giving it a one, which probably speaks to why only 28% were using it as their primary mode of communication. Some of the recurring feedback that we received in that survey was that the system was difficult to navigate, which I can vouch for. They were limited on what, they, what and how they could share. And there was a lack of parent engagement. 
I would also like to note that there was a lot of feedback in that survey to bring back Class Dojo. I wanted to address that really quick, but that's a K through eight system, which is great, um, but it doesn't facilitate all of our needs as a whole district. However, Parent Square does have a Class Dojo type feel. All right, next slide. So a little bit about Parent Square and why we chose this tool as our new communication platform. It's a unified platform that offers a whole host of tools which allows district schools administrators and teachers more effectively to communicate more effectively and engage with their families and students. Like Remind, it has mass notifications and urgent alerts with two-way communications, including chat. Um, it has a mobile application for admin and parents on both Android and um, Apple. Uh, it has teacher and classroom communications as well as direct messaging. Next slide. Unlike Remind, it also has two-way translation on both the posts from this district, but also um, communications and chats. For, so for example, if a parent were to reach out in Spanish, it would translate that back to us, to the teacher in the teacher's preferred language. So they would be able to type in their own preferred language back to us and have it translated. Um, for a district admin like myself, it also connects to our social media, our Facebook and Twitter for website sharing. It also allows for forms and permission slips to be filled out on the site. It has appointments for signups like parent teacher conferences, technology pickups. It has calendars and RSVPs, and it also has volunteer and classroom supply signups. So in short, as this graphic so lovingly displays, uh, before Parent Square, there was just a lot of different things being sent out and a lot of different modalities. And Parent Square aims to direct everything to one source and be able to have all those forms, flyers, sheets, um, and communications all in one spot. Next slide. As with most communication platforms, the primary purpose is to minimize messaging overload. Um, as we know as parents, um, we're getting inundated with uh, all sorts of different communications about various happenings in the lives of our children. Um, and parents in this app uh, can check on their preferred method of notification, whether that's email, text, the app, or any combination of these three. That being said, admin like myself uh, would still have the ability to override that system in the case of an emergency. If there were something that we needed to push out communications, we would be able to override those preferences and they would get alerted in every mode. Next slide. As I just mentioned, there is an app. So parents are able to log in either via the desktop or via the app. Um, and more information will be given out to parents on how to download that app and uh, register with Parents Square uh, beginning next week. We'll be sending out an activation email with that information. Those who do not register are still input in our system because it is synced with our power schools. So we would still have to be able to be able to text, email, or use the phone notifications. What they wouldn't be getting um, is the news feed and the additional app um, elements. So if you go to the next slide, I'll show you what that news feed kind of looks like. It's a little hard to see, but as you can see, it, it almost looks like it has more of a social media type feel. You can see the events on the right. You can see signups and RSVPs. Um, in the middle is the news feed. Um, and so if parents do create that account, they can see all that additional content. They'll be able to message the teachers. They'll be able to leave comments on photos that teachers have posted. They'll be able to sign permission slips. Um, and then parents can subscribe to whichever schools or classes are applicable to them. So for example, one parent may have a third grader at Dry Hollow and a sixth grader at TDMS, and they would only be able, or they would only uh, see information applicable to those classes or schools. While parent two has an Innovations Academy student and a seventh grader at TDMS who also happens to be on the basketball team. So they'd be able to see all the pertinent information to those classes, schools, and groups. And the next slide. And last but not least, um, for us on the other side of things, there's a lot better um, and easier reading of metric data on the back end. So we have uh, metrics for open rates, posts, reach and interaction, and features such as the signups and the photos. And it's broken down by districts and schools. And as you can see, that is a snapshot of our current data breakdown. So right now, of course, this will um, change as registration begins for next year. We're at 99.4 contactable, which means we don't have, um, we have hardly any parents that are considered unreachable at the moment. 
Um, moving forward, uh, we're going to be rolling this out with this next school year. Um, information went out to teachers today on activating their accounts, and information will be sent to parents next week. Throughout the next month, I foresee us um, undergoing a significant amount of training, um, and there are different varieties of opportunities that will be coming up, including self-paced training modules, a training video, potential webinars, and one-on-ones with myself for future training. And that's it, unless there are any other questions. Any questions from the directors? I just think it sounds like a fantastic tool that will help improve communication. So thank you. All right. Well, thank you. I'll delete my remind now. So thank you. All right. Next um, report that we have is the superintendent's report, and we'll have uh, Dr. Bernal. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to present. I just wanted to provide you a brief uh, update on strategic planning process and where we are at. Um, next slide, please. So just to recap our work to date in February and March of this year, um, public consulting group, uh, the consulting group we've been working with to help us through the strategic planning process, um, they did um, community forum, uh, focus groups um, and survey work. Um, so all of that work was completed in February and March and we had very good participation from a variety of our stakeholders. And then in April and May, uh, we did an, a public consulting group then did an analysis of all of that data. From the outcomes of all that data was the steering committee worked with our consultants to develop our focus areas. And remember we have five focus areas we've identified. We also created the portrait of a graduate to be included in our strategic plan. And then we updated, did updates to our mission, vision, and equity statements. And then in June and this month, we, the steering committee has been working through the five focus areas. We've been developing our measurable action steps to support each focus area. Um, we've done the finalization of our mission, vision, and equity statements, as well as our portrait of a graduate. Next slide. And what's next? So by July 26th, um, we will have the completion of our final edits to the strategic plan. And then our consultants will send that off to their graphics team who will incorporate it all into the finalized draft of the product. Um, between August 3rd through the 9th, um, Stephanie and I will probably do, be doing most of the heavy lifting editing process of the final design product when we receive it. And then by August 12th, uh, our consulting group will deliver to us our final design strategic plan. And then we look forward to, at the end of August, rolling out and implementing our 2027 strategic plan. Um, we're very excited about this work. Um, it's exciting to see it come to fruition. I really want to thank everybody who participated in this process. Um, it was an invaluable process where we got a lot of good feedback. And I think it's really going to provide a great roadmap for where our district is going in the next five years. Dr. Bernal, any questions for Dr. Bernal on her report on the strategic planning update? Because I look forward to just kind of the end results. It's going to be exciting to kind of have new vision, mission statement, and a lot of other elements that um, I think will move the needle forward for all the kiddos in the district. Um, let's see, the next item that we have is an action item under superintendent. Um, and so that is an update to the contract. And so we're updating the contract and that's to reflect the changes that we've had in recent legislation. And so it brings a contract into compliance with newly passed legislation, which is Senate Bill 1521. While doing uh, that update, we also updated the contract to reflect um, the salary and other terms of the agreement. Um, that superintendents entitled to based on the recently approved salary increases for all employees as well as other contract improvements, all other employees. So things like Juneteenth now being a federal holiday that had not been in the language that is in there now. Um, and then um, the standard language of the superintendent contract being tied to the cost of living adjustment as our unions, um, that remains and that just got brought forward um, for this year. So. Any questions from the directors on, on these contract modifications? I'm not seeing none, then I will entertain a motion uh, for approval of the vice superintendent's contract salary schedule as presented. 
to uh, approve the revised superintendent's contract and salary schedule as presented. All right, do I have a second for that? Second. Got a motion by Director Richardson, seconded by Director Rasmussen to approve the revised superintendent's contract and salary schedule as presented. Any further discussion? Seeing none, then we'll move to a vote. Director Lopez. Director Rasmussen. Aye. Director Jones. Aye. Director Nelson. Aye. Director Stevens. Aye. Director Richardson. Aye. Chair votes aye as well. All right, our next report comes from our Chief Financial Officer. Uh, so we'll have Ms. Flath. Mr. Chair and board members, thanks for having me. Um, I included your usual reports. The first one is the bond planning update and timeline. Um, and you all probably have already seen in the public that um, Stephanie's done a great job putting all the bond planning documents and anything from our community meeting is also out on that webpage. Any discussion and we'll also include this report on that webpage. Um, since our last meeting, we did have a couple of bond leadership meetings and we had a bond planning committee meeting to have a general discussion and decompress what happened at the community meeting. Um, essentially, we're kind of in a pause waiting on updated taxable values. Um, we believe they're gonna change. And then after we hopefully have some updates in the next few weeks from the county, we'll be able to start some polling and see how what the community can support as far as what our bond pricing will look like. In the meantime, we are looking actively at options. What are we looking at based on the feedback we've received? Um, still likely looking at the new high school that seems to be the most supported. Still, of course, looking at that and having another bond community meeting in September. Um, in the meantime, we're also looking at possibilities of repurposing the high school if we do build a new high school, what are we going to do with the existing high school? And I think we have some good options. So we're weighing those out and seeing what, what else we could do in the meantime. Um, other than that, we're kind of in limbo waiting on numbers. And we also are contracting with an individual who will firm up some possible numbers for us. So we have some more definitive information based on our student population numbers, what that cost could look like, because right now the the market seems to be pretty volatile up and down. So trying to really firm that up because we would hate to say we could build a high school for this and have it come back substantially more or substantially less. So we want to be accurate. So that's kind of long story short where we're at. Any questions? That's included the June 30th, 2022 financial statements. And I'm going to put not complete on these because it'll probably take us about two or three months to wrap that up. We are, as of the organizational meeting, approving our audit firm. We'll start work on our audit. But in the meantime, we still have information we're refining and clearing out. Um, the large, largest um, noticeable thing, I guess I would say, is that um, we do have several grants that are outstanding for payments from the state. Um, they're just kind of delayed. They're also having staffing issues like everyone else. So they're asking people to be patient, but we're over a million dollars patient right now. So hoping that actually it's 1.8, but hoping that comes out very soon and they do have to clear out their financial data. Um, to date, it looks, you know, the general fund is still about 900,000 projecting and ending. We do have ebbs and flows that will come out of that, still clearing things out, but we still have a good positive ending balance, which is always good news. Just to remind you, we ended last year with $400,000 fund balance. So anything about that is some ground we've made up over the last year. So we'll continue to watch that. I did want to talk about this last um, little section, which is in the orange. It's included in your board packet. We will also include these particular documents on the website under the business office page. So the community and you can find them easier if you would like, one stop shopping. But I wanted to make sure there wasn't any confusion because there's a lot of discussion of what um, the federal monies could be called. There's, there's lots of different acronyms that people have out there. So it can range anything from the CARES Act money to ESSER. There's one, two, and three. 
Um, there's federal relief funds, there's COVID relief funds. They're all synonymous of being the same thing. So again, we're still clearing out um, our cleaning up the books for the year end. Um, ESSER one and the, there was a comprehensive distance learning section of ESSER one. Those ones were completely spent the year before, but I included them on the report just so people understand where the funds were spent. We still have ESSER two funds that we are using and it looks like our balance will be five to 600,000 into next year, which will probably be fully expended next year. And then we still have ESSER three funds, um, which are also synonymous if people are saying ARP funds. So anything with ARP, which you can see all over the state and county, nation, city, um, it's given out in a variety of ways is all part of ESSER three. And it includes some of the things that you have already approved, but just give you um, a picture. We did get 6.7 from that, but we are uh, spending some of that for summer school, which we have actively going. We did get state funds for summer school and enrichment programs for K through eight but it does require a 25% match as it did last year. So that particularly comes from SR3 as compliance from our unfinished learning, which we're required to spend 20% of our funds in unfinished learning. That's a lot of information. Any questions particularly on any of those sections? Questions from directors? No question. Just come, it's. I'm glad to be able with the new website be able to post the information so it's not as convoluted to find. So thank you, Ms. Bowen, Ms. Flath, for making that doable on the website now. Yep. So I just have to. I would be remiss if I didn't add one more note. The financial summary. Um, literally, as soon as I sent this off, I got an email that our high school pavilion, which will appear someday, is now backlog to the end of August. So Kurt is not here to say I told you so, but I'm just saying it still is in the works. It's in a warehouse somewhere and they have a stacking issue, but it will be here at some point. And um, two notes, we did receive $22,000 in insurance funds for the fire that was by the high school, right next to the pavilion, um, the, sorry, Amaton Field. Um, the cost of repairing that, which seems crazy, but it had a lot of electrical and irrigation things over there was 65,000. So it didn't cover all of it, but it was, we weren't sure what it would cover. So that was just a note. On that, is the 22, is that net? And meaning like that's after deductible or we got 22, which would cover deductible? You know, you know what I'm saying? I do. And the deductible for property is 10000 okay. And we did increase that this the year before last because the rates were going up so high. But it includes the deductible. But in addition, it's whether or not, this is going to be really nerdy, but whether or not that was a building or a just a piece of structure. And it was a little of everything. So the best, they did work hard to try and get us that much. But twenty two out of the 65000 was the most we could get out of there. Okay. Could you talk a little bit about the capital fund you're creating? Sure. That, um, oh, yes. Thank you. You get it. We're bringing you a Snickers bar. Um, <laughs> I, I did add the capital fund to the report. Um, the reason it's on there is um, the board had approved this last year, opening the capital fund. We did get some funds this year from the county for an equipment tax. It's a heavy equipment tax. We received a $25,000 check. Then we got another one just a week or two ago, but those are we're putting in our capital funds. So it'll have some revenue finishing out 22, starting in 23, but starting next year, anything we collect for premise use agreements or any of those uses plus any construction excise tax monies or anything that's taxed on like that heavy equipment or anything unusual, we'll put in the capital projects fund to start building up some major repairs that we have coming. And so you build the fund up and then how, uh, what are your plans for spending the money that's in capital funds? Because that's what it, it's like a savings account, right? Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what, what plans do you have there? Well, we have a very long list of things we'd like to fix. <laughs> so it's, it will depend on a couple of things, but one is um, how much revenue we have in there. For example, one of the highlighted projects we have would be 
putting the channel, replacing channel its roof part of that because it's leaking quite a bit. That's gonna be five or 600,000. So 25,000 won't get us there. Another option that we're looking at is the Safe Routes to Schools grant we're really competitive with. Um, we're in discussions with the city to try and figure out how we can fund that and get schools, get the, get the sidewalks around channel with repaired. That, that'll take a little chunk. So the goal is this next year, I'm, I'm gonna make a facilities report. And then my hope is to have a facilities committee that will involve public and board members and whoever wants to be involved and talk about here's all the projects we have and help help us look at what what priorities we can have and what other ways could we build up capital projects and have that discussion but we have a long list it's just picking through how much money we want to spend and where it can go good idea All right, and any other questions, comments? Seeing none, all right, thank you, Ms. Flatt. Our next report is a board attorney's report. Uh, Mr. Corey, anything from your end? Greetings from the great state of Utah. <laughs> I'm uh, on vacation visiting my 91-year-old father, so uh, excuse the beard and the casual attire. <laughs> I don't have anything to report tonight, no. Yeah, did we get, uh, you mentioned the agreement last meeting about, um, I think, was it the grazing uh, that we were waiting on? Did we get that renewal? It's the, actually, it's, it's not the grazing renewal. It's the uh, MCCC uh, lease with, um, uh, for the Watonka campus. And as of last Friday, when I, uh, left on vacation. I had not received it. I had followed up with um, uh, Mr. Gonzalez. I'm trying to remember his first name, but uh, no, I have not yet received that. Cool. All right. Thank you. When I get when I get back, I will follow up with him on that because it's now overdue. Right. Okay. Well, thank you. All right, uh, next item on the agenda is our discussion and action items. Uh, first action item we have is a request to approve the following changes for the Oregon Department of Education's official record. Uh, so this um, is a name change. Um, so as you may recall last year, um, D21 ended up taking in Riverbend Community School within uh, the district. Uh, so it's no longer separate. So with that, uh, we're um, that will still exist as the Innovations Academy. So that's kind of the first. So the name change from Riverbend Community School to the Innovations Academy, and that'll be for the ODE institution number. Secondly is a street address change. So previously Riverbend Community School had been up at CGCC. It's now moving back to the Watonka campus. So that address is being updated. And then uh, lastly, we also have a grade level change where previously Riverbend Community School is only for grades nine through 12. Uh, the Innovations Academy will now be kindergarten through 12th. Um, so any questions from directors on, on those updates that we'll be submitting to ODE? If not, then I will obtain, entertain a motion. I move to uh, approve the uh, name change, street address change, and grade level changes as described by Chair. All right, do I have a second for that? Second. All right, so we've got a motion by Director Nelson to approve the uh, changes um, and naming street address and grade level change for um, Riverbend to Innovations Academy, seconded by Director Lopez. Any further discussion on that? Not seeing none. So with that, we'll move to a vote. Uh, Director Lopez, Director Rasmussen. Aye. Director Jones? Aye. Director Nelson? Aye. Director Stevens? Aye. Director Richardson? Aye. Chair votes aye as well. <clears throat> All right, our next action item that we have is the approval of district staff to attend the DLI conference. And so that is out of state travel and we'll have Ms. Flath back to present that. Hello, so in November of this year, there is a D21 
DLI Immersion Program Conference in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, I will butcher the name, so I'm not going to say it, but it's supposed to be um, very cutting edge and provide the latest and greatest information. We're on the third year of providing the DLI program, and we have yet to connect with any partners out of state. So it'll be a good opportunity for, it'll be the um, principal and now the vice principal who is newly hired and then two of the teachers or aides that are with the program. So give a good, good opportunity for them to go down and connect with their counterparts in other states. So requesting early approval because we could wait a few months, but early registration is cheaper. So that we get this out of the way. So just requesting approval for them to attend. Thank you for the explanation. Any questions, uh, comments regarding the request being made? If not, then I will entertain a motion. I make a motion to approve the district, district staff to attend the DLI conference as presented. All right, do I have a second? I'll second it. All right, so we've got a motion by Director Lopez uh, to approve up to four channel with elementary staff to attend La Cosecha conference in Santa Fe, New Mexico in November of 22, seconded by Director Stevens. Any further discussion on that? None, we'll move to a vote. Director Lopez. Director Rasmussen. Aye. Director Jones. Aye. Director Nelson. Aye. Director Stevens. Aye. Director Richardson. Aye. Chair votes aye as well. Thank you, Ms. Flapp. And it's exciting to see going into our third year with the DLI program. Our next action item is um, the replacement of the Dallas High School Computer Lab. And again, Ms. Flath will be presenting that. Yes, um, this is a project we had kind of already started, but um, uh, the robot in this is used by the robotics program at the high school, which they had just gone to several um, big conferences and competed. And this is to keep it up to date. Um, there's only one computer lab that's PC based. Otherwise we use a lot of um, Chromebooks and other things that are minorly. This will get it up to date at the early, the last time it's been replaced is 2017 and 18. And it does, um, it is expensive. It's $165,000 and to be paid from a combination of, we're hoping high school success as their funds. And then there probably is some general funds in the high school budget that they can have afford to fund it between those three things. So keeping us up to date and current. And even if, let's say, when we get, when we have a new bond, it, likely would move to a new, it would move to the new program. It's not stationary where it has to be stuck in the building. So I'm just requesting approval. Laugh, any questions or comments regarding the request? Seeing none, then I will entertain a motion. I'll make a motion, but I wanna highlight, our kids went to Worlds, okay? That is not small, that is big. <laughs> And I move to approve the CFO to be authorized to spend up to 165000 for the Dallas High School Computer Lab upgrade, which can be paid for from ESSER, two or three high school success and or general fund. All right. Do I I'll, I'll second it. Got a motion by Director Richardson to approve the CFO to be authorized to spend up to 165000 for the Dallas High School Computer Lab upgrade, which can be paid from ESSER, two or three high school success and or general fund, seconded by Director Jones. Any further discussion or comment regarding that? Seeing none, then we'll move to a vote. Director Lopez. Aye. Director Rasmussen. Aye. Director Jones. Aye. Director Nelson. Aye. Director Stevens. Aye. Director Richardson. Aye. Chair votes aye as well. Thank you, Ms. Flath. All right, next on the agenda is the first reading on school board policies. Um, so starting with um, policy IIBGA, that's the electronic communication system. So the revisions proposed in this policy come from OSPA's recommended sample policy to update language to what electronic communication platforms are utilized and to include consistency throughout the policy. So the word insure, I-N, S-U-R-E was changed to ensure E-N-S-U-R-E, due to the intent and meaning used in this policy. Uh, basically to ensure with an E means to make certain, to ensure with an I means to protect against risk by regularly paying an insurance company. So that's the need for the change. 
Um, the change in language follows the intent of this policy, which is to ensure compliance with the Children's Internet Protection Act, as well as several federal and state laws and statutes. Um, so on the policy, then you can see that um, the updates are in the uh, blue colored font. Um, so any questions from directors? Again, we will revisit this at our next meeting for its second reading and adoption. But any comments here or revisions that would need to be made ahead of the second reading next month? Seeing none, and we will continue. That concludes first readings for tonight. On second readings on policies, tonight we have policy KG. This is the community use of district facilities. So this updated, um, So these uh, second readings um, is just for our use. Um, probably the biggest change with the uh, use of district equipment materials that follows it um, is going to be that the approval for things like the bleachers that are probably our most popular um, equipment usage item will no longer be an approval required by the board. That will be by the superintendent. Um, but any comments or questions regarding the second? reading for policy KG on the community use of district facilities. Seeing none, so if there is none, then I will entertain a motion for its adoption. Uh, I move to adopt uh, policy KG, communi community use of district facilities. Okay, do we have a second for that? Second. All right, I've got a Motion by Director Nelson to approve policy KG, community use of district facilities as presented, seconded by Director Richardson. Is there any further discussion on that? Comment? Seeing none, then we'll move to a vote. Director Lopez? Aye. Director Rasmussen? Aye. Director Jones? Aye. Director Nelson? Aye. Director Stevens? Okay, not hearing them. Uh, Director Richardson? Aye. Chair votes aye as well. All right. The other one I kind of briefly mentioned uh, just a bit ago is policy KGF slash EDC. This is the authorized use of district equipment and materials. Again, the biggest change there is that the approval for that uh, shifts down from the board down to the superintendent. So um, any questions or comments on that? And if not, then I will entertain a motion for its adoption. Motion to adopt policy EDC KGF authorized use of district equipment and materials. All right, do I have a second for that? I'll second it. All right, so I've got a motion by Director Richardson to <clears throat> approve policy EDC KGF authorized use of district equipment and materials as presented, seconded by Director Rasmussen. Any further discussion or comment on that? Seeing none. Then we'll move to a vote. Director Lopez. Aye. Director Rasmussen. Aye. Director Jones. Aye. Director Nelson. Aye. Director Stevens. Aye. Yes. Director Richardson. Aye. Chair votes aye as well. All right, um, that concludes um, the second readings um, that we have for tonight. Um, next is um, our updates to the administrative regulations. Um, first one tonight, and just kind of as a reminder, so administrative regulations, those are kind of details, directions governing the operations of the district. So policies are kind of the upper level, and then these are more kind of the detailed items that um, our administrative team from the superintendent on down. Uh, works to develop. Um, the first one that we have is policy JBAR. This is a transgender and gender non-conforming students. So this administrative regulation will serve to support D21's transgender and non-conforming student population. D21 school administration has expressed the need to define roles and responsibilities of staff as well as student rights under the law as this student demographic has increased over time. 
It outlines the rights of students who identify as transgender or non-conforming under Oregon state law and Title IX federal law. It also serves as a guide for administrators and staff in supporting our transgender and non-conforming student population. This administrative regulation supports D21's commitment to ensuring and providing a safe and welcoming learning environment where each student feels respected and welcomed. So um, being uh, JBAR, this is the um, corresponding policy is policy JB, which is the equal educational opportunity. So any um, comments or questions from the board on this policy? Director Richardson. I just have one question. There may be a typo under 1A definitions. Identify may need to be identity. Or is there some reason that's gender identify? Just like a Scrivener's. Scrivener. That, that seems to make sense to me. Do you concur, Dr. Bernal, that that second word there on 1A should be identity, not identify? Yes. I was going to raise the same question about that, too. Okay. Any other comments from the board on that one? Okay. Then the next um, AR that we have is policy JFCEB AR, personal electronic devices and social media. So this is a new one. Um, And so um, for this one, we as a district currently don't have an AR that supports policy JFCB, C, excuse me, JFCEB, the personal electronics devices and social media. So this new AR comes from OSPA's recommended sample policy of ARs. So the language proposed in this actually aligns with um, the current practices and procedures within um, D21. Any questions regarding that um, new one that um, outlines electronic devices and social media. So we have a policy that goes with the AR, is that what you're saying? Correct. We just had, did not have the accompanying AR to it. Okay. All right, any other comments or questions? And lastly, we have um, Policy IIBGA AR, this is electronic communication systems. Um, so this updated AR includes again, proposed language from OSPA's recommended sample policy. Um, and there's some references there to policy IIBGA, uh, to what electronic communication platforms are utilized and to include consistency throughout the AR. Additional language proposed aligns with D21's current practices and procedures guidelines and etiquette when using the district's electronic communication system, compliance with the Children's Internet Protection Act, as well as other federal and state laws and statutes, and a better defined electronic applications the district may use. So um, any questions or comment regarding policy IIBGA-AR? Not seeing none, so that concludes then um, the review of our administrative regulation updates. And lastly, um, we have um, our public comment section. All right, so the North Wasco County School District Board of Director welcomed public comment on agenda items um, and agenda items. Uh, those comments are limited to three minutes per speaker. The board will not take action nor respond to public comment at that meeting. Following the meeting, the board chair, vice chair, and superintendent will together determine the appropriate level of response. The board at its discretion may require that a proposal, inquiry, or request be submitted in writing and reserves the right to refer the matter to the administration for action or for study and to report at a subsequent meeting. And this is in alignment with policy BDDH, Dash AR, public participation in board meetings. If the board requires a proposal, inquiry, or request to be submitted in writing, it should be sent by email with any reference materials sent to Cindy Miller at 
And that email address is millerc at nwasco.k12.or.us. Lastly, speakers may offer objective criticism of district operations or programs, but the board will not hear complaints concerning specific district personnel. Speakers are also invited to submit questions in writing via email to Cindy Miller at millerc at nwasco.k12.or.us, and that will be reviewed by the board chair and superintendent. Um, before we, uh, we do have um, folks uh, in person that will want to make comment tonight. We did receive um, two in writing, given just the quantity of folks that want to comment tonight in person. Um, I will not be reading them, um, but we did get two. Um, the first one is from uh, Ms. Karen Wilson, uh, and it's regarding the uh, Administrative regulation, uh, the transgender and gender nonconforming students. So um, that was her topic. Uh, the other person on the same topic um, that we received was from Shannon uh, Saldivar as well. And so the full uh, written copy of their comments will be attached to our meeting minutes once those minutes have been approved um, at the next meeting. So um, for those looking to make public comment tonight, um, once I um, call your name, if you come to the front, remember to push the button so the green light goes, because I always forget. Um, and then um, I will start the timer on my phone um, in terms of three minutes at, at about 30 seconds left. I'll kind of give you a little high sign um, just to let you know to kind of um, wrap uh, your comment up and then we'll move on to the next person. So, um, First uh, person tonight is uh, Mr. Jeff uh, Handley or Hen Hendley. Okay. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me this time to speak to you as board members. Um, I'm here to speak about the administrative policy that was in tonight's up to the JB dash AR, the transgender non-conforming students. Got a couple of concerns I'd like to address. One is I have two kids in the school district. I have one going into seventh grade, one going into fifth grade. My um, both my kids are IEPs. So we work as a team with the school and we're teammates with our teachers, with the school district principals. And there's a statement in here that I'll read it to you that kind of bothers me. It doesn't make it feel like it's a team effort with my children. And it has to do with um, notification and parents. So sorry for my not being here. Let me see here. Okay, so it says, in some circumstances, a student who identifies as transgender may not want their parents to know the identity that they're expressing at school. Well, me as a parent, I, I, I'd like to see you guys drop that out of there. I want to know what's going on with my kids in all aspects of their education and schooling. And I don't agree with the fact that the school would keep, uh, find the right words here, would keep something from me as a parent on the progress of my students that could directly affect their progress. And I, I'd really like to see that stricken from this policy. And the other thing I saw in here was the locker room access kind of bothered me. And I, it's, I get the sense it's to make an individual feel more comfortable in the school. But when, for the sake of that one individual to feel more comfortable, a group of individuals will feel uncomfortable. My daughter would not feel comfortable being in the locker room, girls' locker room, with a biological male. And I, I don't think that it's right that these children should be exposed to that. I, I see that it makes 
um, that calls out certain areas where the transgender student can change in, a, in another area. I'm good with that. But I don't think that the, I'm sorry. I, I just, I don't believe that my daughter and her friends should feel uncomfortable for the sake of somebody else to feel more comfortable. For one person to feel more comfortable, a group of people have to feel uncomfortable. I don't know. Thank you. I'm sorry, I remember more time. All right, th thank you, Mr. Hanley. Um, next, we have uh, Rapika Siufaluma. Um, next is, um, Ian, is that, that Hagen, Haugen, okay, sorry about that. This thing, okay, I have to move it closer. Okay, sorry, I'm a little bit nervous. Whew. So my comment is about the transgender policy as well. As a parent, of, as a trans parent, so a person who is transgender, identifies transgender male, as a parent of this community, I think that's a great policy and that nothing should be stricken from that policy. That's my comment, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hagen. All right, um, our next comment comes from um, Melissa McBurney. Um, I'm here to speak about the transgender uh, or and gender policy as well. Were students and parents asked um, their opinion on this new agenda before it was placed? And how will the students that, that base their beliefs on biblical truth be accommodated um, during this, this new agenda? that is gonna be implemented in the school. Um, another question I have is, it does state that you can have, uh, use single stall restrooms will be available. How many single stall bathrooms are in the elementary school, in the middle school, in the high school? And if there's going to be a long line at these single stall bathrooms, will the tardy policy then be revised for the children that choose to use those bathrooms? And what measures are going to be t taken to protect the child in the bathroom from being uncomfortable or from sexual exposure? Those are the, just the questions that I have. Ms. McBurney. All right, um, our next um, person is uh, Francina Brackenberry. Evening. I just have a quick question. Again, it's regarding the transgender policy. Um, I am interested in knowing how you guys are defining the non-conforming student. Can you provide that tonight or is that something I need to look forward to? Well, we won't be able to do that tonight. We'll follow up and I'm not sure which manner, depending on just kind of the volume of questions and nature of questions, we'll either do similar like we did with the pandemic stuff, either FAQ on the website, or we're not sure kind of what shape it'll take. They may be individual responses back to you personally. That's why we kind of ask for your email and stuff like that. So just depends on the nature, we'll kind of address them, you know, but yeah, the goal is to yes, we know that there's questions and we want to address them. So, and my second question then would a follow up would be, is this policy um, revisable at all? That I will answer quickly because yes, all our policies are, yes. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Ms. Brackenberry. Um, next, uh, Jane White. Hi, um, I just wanted to also speak to the transgender and gender non-conforming policy. Um, as someone who has a younger brother who is trans and began his 
transition in middle school. Um, I just wanted to applaud the board for considering these really important policies and creating an environment for these students to thrive and to feel safe around their teachers and other students. Um, he went through a lot in middle school and they did not have policies like this. And I'm really glad and excited that you guys are considering this um, and taking the steps to make this a safe space for those students who are at greater risk for suicide and self-harm and a number of other incredibly hard situations. So thank you. And I would like to uh, just show my support for the policy. All right, thank you, Ms. White. Um, next we have, um, let me pronounce this one, Pacer. Pizer. Thank you for taking my comment. Um, my comment is also regarding the transgender and non-conforming bill. Um, as a parent of three, P three kids in the district, um, I am overjoyed to see this change happening. Um, the statistics for transgendered children and non-binary or um, non-conforming um, children is high and it severely decreases when there is acceptance and respect of the person's identity. So we need to make sure that we are guiding our policies with the latest science and mental health experts um, regarding these issues. And I'm just glad because this will create a safe space for all students in our district. And they all deserve respect, acceptance, and safety at school. Thank you. All right, thank you for your comment. Um, next we have uh, Jennifer Dewey. John, um, when I just signed coming in. Um, I just, I wanted to say, I like you guys agree that everybody should have um, safety and feel secure when they're going into a um, school. I, having a daughter and a son that are middle school age, it's a trying time that they're just trying to figure everything out in. That being said, these new policies, I would be upset if a, um, my daughter was in changing and, you know, if she came in and she was changing and there was a male in there, a biological male that came in, I don't think it's fair to those students to put them in that situation. Either way, if you have somebody that identifies as a um, transgender, then I believe that maybe there's other spaces for them that they can go into to utilize if they, so I don't think that it should be taking somebody else's freedom and security and safety away from them to make somebody else more comfortable. I think that if there, there's probably grants out there for separate restrooms, separate um, changing facilities, that can accommodate these types of situations. I would plead you to look at that so that the kids don't have to feel insecure. And um, I'm gonna give you two examples that I saw. One was I was going by the high school last year, I was driving and I saw kids doing their run and they have to do a run where they go like out to Kelly and back and all that. And all these high school kids had regular clothes on, like jeans and t-shirts. And I just remember we always had to dress down into shorts so we were doing gym clothes. And I thought, well, that's kind of, in, in my head as I was driving, I was like, oh, I don't know why that, that's gonna be uncomfortable. They gotta be sweaty and they gotta smell when they get done because they're sweating. Well, then I started thinking about it later on, I was like, that is probably the reason they don't get changed. And I don't think that that is a acceptable thing to put somebody else's hygiene in place too, if they want to do that. And as a kid, if I knew that I was gonna have the chance of somebody walking in, there's no way I would change. So that would be one um, scenario. And then I just think that the sheer like 
size. And I'm gonna take middle school, for example. If you go in, kids grow a ton in middle school. You're gonna have substantial size differences. And they grow a ton from seventh to eighth grade. You get the boys, they'll shoot up to six foot. And so you're gonna have kid, girls that are like, I don't know, five, 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 four. And then a boy walks in and he's six foot. How does that make you feel? So I just, it, it, as, a, as a child and growing up, those are things to consider and their safety and concern too. And I'm not saying that you should take something away from somebody to, I just wanna make sure that you understand I don't think that it should be taken away just to make one other person feel comfortable or a smaller to the the larger. I don't know if I said all that well, but anyway, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wheatman. Um, uh, so Brian was right behind you. Did, was that just thinking that you were just signing in? Okay, all right, gotcha. Uh, then, uh, Shelly Ainslinger is our last speaker tonight. It's all good, right? Okay. Um, I also had some questions about the, about JBAR, the transgender and uh, gender nonconforming students. And I had a lot of questions, but some of my biggest concerns were, um, were regarding the restroom accessibility and locker room accessibility. Um, I, I just, I, to me, it's very confusing because I know that like, my, I have elementary age students and we got a note sent home from their teacher that spoke to them about safe spaces and privacy. And I was told about that. Um, so, so that's a big deal, right, to, to young children. Um, but then, and I don't change in front of my eight-year-old boy, and his six-year-old sister doesn't. But then according to these policies, there would be, that would mean that an eight-year-old girl would be able to come in that my son doesn't even know and change or him be standing at a urinal and go to the bathroom next to him. And, and I think that I don't understand, it's difficult because the message that we're sending our kids is, oh yes, you know, one message at school, maybe one message at home is different. And I know we have that all over the board, but I feel I am concerned about um, also the safety in the, in the restrooms. And I'm not saying that I'm worried about transgender students um, causing a problem at all. That's not what I'm saying. But I think when you open up the opportunity for a locker room or a restroom to say that you, to say that anybody could come in, then you're opening up an opportunity for people who have malicious ideas is what I'm saying. And I'm not saying that that is what, that transgender people have that. I'm just saying that that's, you're opening the door for that. I, you know, I'll give you actually, I work a lot with high school kids, um, and I've had four different people tell me experiences that they have had in the locker rooms at the high school, um, where kids who said that they identified as the opposite gender of what they were biologically assigned um, came in. The kids were not in true, really transgender kids. And then they were, at one point, there was actually even some photos that were taken. And the teachers said that their hands were tied. They couldn't do anything because these kids said they identified in one way. And I, so, again, it's not, I'm not saying that transgender kids, that something bad's gonna happen with them coming into the bathroom. I'm just saying that when we open it up with the restroom and the locker room accessibility, I just wanna know how that's gonna be monitored as a parent. I hope that makes sense. And also, um, I, did, I did like the line here about, um, you know, having a restroom, a single stall bathroom that anybody, any student could use. I think that's great. I think that's, but I, I'm, a, I'm a little concerned as to how that's gonna happen in our schools. I mean, my kids are going to the same school that I went to as a student, and they're not large. And I know that we are not um, overflowing with funds. In the, in the school. So those are things that I, as you guys look at this policy and revise it, I would be concerned about those, those things. Safety, finances, how it will impact things in that way. Okay, thank you, Ms. Ainsinger. Um, so that was our last um, 
public comment for tonight. Um, we, we closed it at the beginning, so we will not be doing that. Um, I obviously see some extra hands. So um, like I said, we are interested in, in making sure that, that we know that there's questions out there. We wanna make sure that we address them and speak to them. So I will adjourn the meeting now. I will stay here and we'll visit with anyone. I will write down your questions so that we capture them. And then, um, as I said, depending on the nature of them, we will respond to them individually or find the best manner in which to do so. So um, I'm going to sit here and I will write as long as it takes tonight. So uh, with that, thank you everyone for attending this evening. Uh, meeting is officially adjourned.